Hi, Kevin at Ledoux Guitars. Today I've got a video uh, aimed mostly at uh, sort of beginning or entry level woodworkers, but I think uh, hopefully of equal interest to the guitar makers as well, because what I want to show you today is applicable really to any type of woodwork, regardless of uh, what your end product might be. And that is dressing rough lumber. Now, I know a lot of folks buy lumber that's pre-dressed because they don't have a way to mill it out. And I get that. Uh, you, you've got to do what you've got to do. But I encourage anybody who possibly can to procure your lumber as rough sawn stock as much as you can for uh, really a couple of reasons that, that I find important. First of all, if you can procure a rough cut lumber, and dress it yourself, you're going to save a little bit of money because if you buy pre-dressed lumber, you're paying for the waste and you're paying uh, someone to dress it out for you. But the other advantage for me is it's a little easier to get sometimes if you're, you know, you may find it in any number of locations, you know, a pile in somebody's barn or somebody's got this for sale or, you know, if you can go to a local mill, uh, you can get it and dry it yourself, or you can go to a mill and get it uh, kiln dried from them. And when you store rough lumber, <clears throat> excuse me, when you store rough lumber, um, it is what it is right there. And as you use it, you can dress it to the configuration that you want it, whether you're cutting uh, narrow strips for style and rail work and making doors or, you know, maybe drawer sides or whatever you're situation might be tabletops or whatnot or in the case of uh, the guitar makers you know maybe making up neck blanks or even resawing for thin panels and so on for uh, back and rim stock at any rate um, what i want to show you today is pretty basic but i think it's easily misunderstood by some folks so i'm gonna tr do the old tell you what i'm going to tell you show you that and then tell you what I showed you and tell you what I told you. See if we can make this make sense. First of all, we need to talk about uh, what happens to lumber when it dries. And I'm sure everybody out there already knows. Even lumber that you buy, if you go to the big box stores, you buy lumber that's already dressed out. And when you look at the end of it or you look at the surface, you can see that it's cupped. Well, Cupping occurs, especially in flat sawn lumber, because lumber, uh, the sapwood in lumber dries faster than the heartwood does. And I've selected this cherry board so that you can see that difference. Here's heartwood right here in the board, and here's sapwood. And you can see it in the end grain here as the lighter colored wood here. Well, that dries faster, and it dries before the heartwood does. So it shrinks, lumber always shrinks across its grain and it will create a concave surface on the sapwood side. And of course, the wider the board, the more severe it is. And, you know, there's a lot of things that determine the amount of that cupping. But we need to get rid of that. And even if you had a, <clears throat> a stash of quarter sawn lumber, it may remain quite flat, but it's not going to be flat enough for you to do much of anything with and you need to get the edges squared, and you need to get them straight and parallel and so on. You can't even make a square end from a rough board because you don't know that that edge is straight enough to get that end square with anything. So we need to dress it out. Now, the first thing that you need to do when you dress lumber is you need to flatten a surface. And the, the reason I made a big deal out of that concavity and that shrinkage and warpage and so on is because you want the concave surface down on the table of your joiner. That's very, very important. Uh, because if you put the convex side down, it's likely to rock back and forth a little bit unintentionally. And you're gonna, you may have a hard time getting that flat. It, it would be kind of a waste of time. And by the same token, this piece is pretty straight, but if this were bowed over its length, you'd want that concavity down as well. Sometimes 
you have to A, B, which way do I go here? Because they, it might not always cooperate with you. But the fact is the concave surface has got to go down first if there is one. The next thing that you're going to do from there is you're going to straighten an edge. And you're going to put the surface that you just made flat on the jointer. You're going to put that surface against the fence and you're going to straighten one edge on your jointer. And that's going to bring that edge square to the surface. Now, you could wait and plane the opposite surface and then go back and join an edge. That's perfectly legitimate too. And there's some advantage. That way you get to choose which surface goes against the fence and you can take advantage of the grain orientation of the board and reduce some of the little chipping that may occur when you join an edge. Sometimes that's a, a really important concern. And if you've got both surfaces done, you have that advantage. So now there's another thing that we need to think about. Uh, what if I was going to take a bunch of lumber, let's say one board, two boards, 10 boards, it doesn't matter. Let's say I'm going to cut this into narrow strips and I'm going to make Oh, maybe strips for a cutting board, or I'm going to make style and rail material for doors or frames of some kind. Well, I need to dress that whole board out. That is, I need to flatten the surface. I need to plane it to thickness and get a straight edge so that I can rip widths out at a table saw. But what if I'm going to glue this together? I'm going to glue up two or more boards together because I need to make something wider like a shelf or a tabletop or something like that. In that case, you could avoid uh, dressing that top surface at the planer. You could get your edges prepared and you could join those two boards together and then plane the wider panel a little bit later. Well, that works until you exceed the width of your planer. What do you do then? And I'll give you a little bit of a quick tip on that as we go along. So I'm going to presuppose for this purpose that we're just going to dress this lumber out and then we'll address uh, making wider panels that exceed the width of your panel as a second issue. So let's review very quickly. The series of events is this. Always flatten the surface first. Then you can joint an edge against that flat surface or you can plane the opposite surface and then join an edge. But the sequence has to go that way. After that, you can make the opposite edge, after you've jointed an edge, you can rip the opposite edge so that your two edges are parallel. Can you join both edges? Yeah, if you're going to lay up a wide panel, you probably can, but if the edges of those boards are not nicely parallel, that may work against you. And if it's enough, you may even see it in the finished panel. So I advise under all circumstances, uh, after you've jointed your edge, rip that board as wide as it will yield. And that way you've got all the lumber you can get, but now you've got good parallel edges. After you have done those operations, you square one end of your material and cut the finished lengths that you want. Now I've taken two short pieces of cherry here uh, to demonstrate with, but this applies whether you're working in boards that are 14 inches long or whether you're working in boards that are 14 feet long. The process is still the same. I'm going to turn the camera and I'm going to point you at the jointer and the planer and I'm going to go through the steps. I will have my lapel mic on. I probably won't speak. Uh, over what I'm doing because the planer will be running, the dust collector will be running, but I may just to kind of remind you of things. A couple of quick afterthoughts before I get started here. Uh, this board is also in wind, as you can see when I touch it, it rocks. Well, that's a consideration when you're flattening a surface too, because sometimes that can be very, very severe. Well, the technique for that is to joint a contact corner. You know, you're going to run your material through, but you're going to hit that corner, and this one is off the table. But you're going to try and balance your pressure as you 
cut through and then concentrate your pressure on the opposite corner that's down on the table until you arrive at a flat surface. Now that may take two or maybe even three passes if that uh, wind is severe enough. Okay. Now, what if the board you've got is too wide for the jointer? This is an eight inch jointer. This is just fine here. This board's only five or six inches wide. But what if this board was 12 inches wide? Can I joint this and then flip the board around and send it back through again? I don't recommend that at all. I think your best way to handle that is either hand plane that surface flat and then go to your planer. Um, but the subject of this video is how to machine out your stock. So I'm, we're going to restrict ourselves to that. The best way that I know around that is to take that board and get a mark on the center of it and split that right open, either with a handheld power saw or if you've got a band saw that you can do that with, cut right down through the center of it, flatten those halves, and then glue those back together. Joint the edges and glue them back together. And you'll see very little variation in that. There won't be too much wood loss, so the grain will go back together nicely. That's to my mind, that's about the best solution that I've ever been able to come up with. I want to point out over the noise here, I have a little patch here of undressed material. This is clearly not flat, but I have flat surface all the way around that. If you have that occurring, you can send that through the planer and plane your opposite surface. This will go through the planer beautifully, and then you can flip the board over and plane this off. Sometimes it's a little, a little easier than having to push material through that jointer. So I'm going to joint an edge of each piece, and then we're going to take a little sidebar here. When you join a board, you really don't push it through the joiner, you pull it through the joiner. And what that means is I'm going to guide the material over the cutter head, and as soon as I get six inches or so on the outside table, I'm going to concentrate my pressure there, just ahead of the cutter head. Thereby pulling the material past the cutter. If you constantly keep your pressure at the back of the board, you'll actually cut a, con uh, a convexity. Now, if I were going to glue up a wide panel that just consisted of these two boards, uh, you see, I don't even have a jointed edge here, but I do have these edges jointed. I could glue those up directly right now, even with that surface rough. And I could then take this over to the planer and pass it through as one piece, assuming that it does not exceed the width of my planer. Then I have a problem, but we'll get to that momentarily. But I'm going to assume and uh, to keep this demonstration going in the right direction or directions that it's intended, uh, 
I'm going to assume that we're also maybe going to rip out several pieces. So my next step would be from here to plane that opposite surface and then come back and do any ripping that I want to do. Now it's important also to remember that we're going to plane this upper surface, but the purpose of this is to bring the lumber to the specific uh, thickness that we need for whatever it is we're making up. So uh, that may not include just one board, but it might include 30 or 40 pieces of lumber. You know, you might be building a, I don't know, maybe a whole bunch of triple dressers. I don't know. At any rate, the thing to remember is that you're going to start with the thickest piece of lumber that you have that you've already flattened um, because thickness will vary. You're going to start with the thickest piece and you're, you're going to run every piece in the lot through that needs to come to that thickness. And then you're going to adjust the planer, run everything through, adjust and run everything through until you arrive at your final thickness. So having said that, I'm going to create noise again and just show you very quickly the planing operation. So now I've brought my lumber to the desired thickness, whatever that might be, and we're all nice and clean. We've got flat surfaces. The opposite surfaces are parallel and smooth, and I have a jointed edge, but I don't necessarily have parallel edges yet on either of these pieces. As I said, if I just want to glue them up and then treat that as another whole board, by joining an edge and ripping to width, I can do that. But let's assume that we're, um, we're gonna cut strips out of this. And so now is the time that we do that. But so that I'm not wasting lumber, I'm just gonna rip these out as wide as the, as the boards will bear. But the concept is of course the same. Adjusting my saw. And we're just going to get them as wide as possible. So there we are. Underestimated a little bit. So let's assume now uh, that I need to make up a wider panel. As I said, we could do this with rough sides up. We could do that, uh, but then we have trouble dressing them out if they exceed the width of the planer. So what do I do? Uh, let's say I need to make up something 18 inches wide. My planer is only 15 inches wide, or for that matter, 28 inches wide. Doesn't matter. Uh, how can I keep those surfaces in nice alignment? I mean, when you glue stuff up, sometimes it wants to creep a little bit. You can't always make sure that you've got control over that. It's very hard to do. So one of the ways you can do that is a very simple technique called a spline. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of or are fully aware of what splines are. So I don't mean to be condescending, but... I've made uh, splines. I keep splines around the shop all the time. And I drum sand these down to 125 thousandths of an inch thick because a, a normal carbide tip saw blade will cut a curve 125, 126 thousandths. And if you don't have a drum sander, you can rip these out on your table saw. It might take a few tries to get them just right 
but once you get it just right, you make up a whole bunch of them, so you got extra laying around. I keep these around because I spline things together quite often um, in the guitar shop, part of the deal here. So I'm going to adjust my saw blade until it's standing up half the width of this spline. Now here's the beauty of this whole thing. I'm going to remember what my upper surfaces are because I've got color working for me. I'm going to keep the sap wood down. But if not, you'd want to make a pencil mark to show you what your show faces are. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to remember that my under surface is going to go against the fence because you want the same surface against the fence all the time. I don't even need to really measure this. You could, but I don't really need to. What I'm going to do is just eyeball the center of that because it doesn't need to be dead center. But I'm going to eyeball that and then putting the same relative surface against the fence, I'm going to rip a groove. So here's my boards with the grooved edges. And uh, by the way, you can see that those edges, the quality of that lumber is just terrible. Uh, there's, there's worm tracks in here and all that stuff. And there's even a little bit of waned edge over here. This is not uh, representative of workmanlike quality. You would want to eliminate all of this. But for the purposes of this demonstration, um, I don't mind using this stuff that needs to be really reshaped and this stuff needs to be done away with. Which, by the way, as you're doing your work, eliminate all of this stuff. Uh, knots and all kinds of cracks and little things like that that don't belong in your work. Try and eliminate them even before you start dressing out your lumber. Or rip it away if you can during the process because it just it's just a deterrent from your, the quality of your work. So I just set my spline in position and... That spline wants to be a snug fit. That is, it wants to be, uh, shall we say, a, a comfortable friction fit. Uh, we don't want to use a lot of force to drive that in there. In fact, if you perceive just a hair of slop in that, it would be acceptable because when you put glue on that, um, that's going to swell just a little bit. And if those splines are real tight, it's just going to make everything a little bit harder to get together. Not a little bit. It's going to make it a lot harder to put it together. And you could end up regretting that. So you can see there, those go together nicely. Now, you may also see that that spline is just a little bit narrow. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you don't want that to show in your finished work, then you might want to tweak that. But if you bring that very, very close, you can actually slide a little sliver of the same spline material into the end of that and clean that up, and it would be absolutely not visible. Uh, so there it is. And as you can see, I'm going to grab a clamp here just so that you can see that this really does work. And I'm going to Put some pressure on this thing and draw it up. It is, of course, dry. I did not glue this, but there it is. Now, you could do this with any number of boards you need to, and it's going to help uh, keep those boards nicely even. Are they absolutely perfect? No. But with some judicious uh, scraping or sanding, whatever is within your capability, or better yet, uh, if you have a nice smoothing plane like this, you could go over that surface and level that all up, or even it up, I should say, and make it as perfect as you want it to be. So the quick review. You start dressing lumber by flattening a surface. 
the best surface to start with is the concave surface if there is one. The next thing to do is either joint one edge or establish thickness by planing the opposite surface. If you plane before you joint, then obviously you're going to joint after you plane this opposite surface. But then you're going to joint one edge, not both, just one edge. Then you're going to go to your table saw and you're going to establish width by ripping the opposite edge, either by ripping pieces of the width that you need or ripping your boards as wide as they will bear, depending on your particular needs. Then you can square one end because you have parallel edges to work from. Um, then you can square one end and then cut to whatever lengths you need. Uh, remember that all of this is for the purpose that we don't just want to clean the lumber up, but our machinery, cutting, machi uh, cutting boards square or at a particular angle or doing joinery operations or routing or molding, whatever it is we need to do, it all relies on having straight edges, parallel surfaces, and so on in order for those machines to gain bearing surface against the work. Otherwise, it's all for naught. Lastly, I just want to suggest that this demonstration was all about doing this with machinery. I do a lot of this stuff, so I do it by machinery because I may be dressing out enough stuff for a bench top or a piece of furniture or even short run architectural millwork, uh, as well as for guitar stuff. But you could do all of this with hand planes. The more material you got to dress out, the harder it's going to be to do that. But still, uh, I don't want anyone to think that I don't advocate the use of hand tools. I have a good complement of hand planes and I use them. And I would encourage you, uh, jointed edges can be even better if you can run over them with a hand plane because you can take any of the mill marks out of them that might be there. And a smoother edge glues up better or a smoother surface will glue up better than one with even just little tiny mill marks. So by all means, if you don't have a hand plane, get one and learn to use it. Practice on scraps of wood. And if you do have one and you're competent with it, well, that's to your credit. But if you're not quite competent with it, practice. You can get better. I promise you can get better. So anyway, there you have it. I want to thank you for watching this video. Once again, I'm Kevin Ledoux at Ledoux Guitars. Uh, I hope you'll put a like on this video. And if you have not subscribed to my channel, uh, I'd like to invite you to do just that. Thanks again for watching my video.